This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 248 was recorded on December 3rd, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets to better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, a focused play on miners and holders of uranium. Regular Macro Voices listeners already know that we've been warning since August that a decisive close below 92 on the dollar index could signal the beginning of an accelerated move down in the dollar, and that's exactly what happened this week. Accordingly, this week's show is entirely about the dollar and other currencies, what's happening and why, and what comes next. We'll kick it off with Alhambra Investment CIO Jeffrey Snyder joining me in the feature interview to revisit his dollar bullish euro dollar thesis and consider where the market could be headed from here and whether or not this week's move invalidates his prior views. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick's chart deck will focus entirely on currencies. Not just the dollar index we hear about in the headlines, but also the underlying currency pairs that make it up as well. And I'm Patrick Sorosna. Now, Eric, let's jump into that S&P 500. Literally since the vaccine, every single pullback only lasts a couple of days and almost immediately the market starts to rally. Old dips are being bought and this market keeps crawling higher. How long is this going to last? Well, that's the, the big question, isn't it? I mean, there's lots and lots of really smart and in some cases really famous guys now saying, OK, look, this is crazy. This is it. This market is overbought. Well, I mean, I've been saying that for a long time, and uh, I've been wrong. It's, it's kind of funny. This is the only business where the first guy to see it is, is wrong, and it's the last guy to notice it who gets credited with making the perfect call. It's very clear to me that this the market is overpriced. I think everybody is still vaccine drunk, but, uh, you know, it keeps grinding higher. How many more all-time highs do we get before gravity sets in? I'm not really sure. Nobody's talking about the mink strain story, the story about the coronavirus crisis where there's been a confirmed jump from human beings to another species, minks, little animals, and back to human beings. The implication is that that could render a vaccine still operative against the uh, prior mutation that it was designed for, but completely ineffective against a new mutation, which could completely complicate this whole pandemic crisis. Nobody's even talking about that story, nor are they talking about the fact that right now, here as we look at the data, the situation is accelerating. 203,000 new cases in the United States yesterday and 2,833 new deaths in one day. That's a one-day record for the crisis. And remember, when the previous record was set back in May, it was May 7th, that's when we were still at the point where doctors didn't really know how to treat this thing. We were using ventilators when it turned out it was more of a bloodborne disease. We understand it much better now. We know how to treat it. The medical system has gotten time to get geared up for it, and we're still breaking out to a new daily record in deaths. Now, if the vaccine news, the expectation that within six months everybody's going to be vaccinated and that vaccine is going to be effective and there's not going to be mutations that render it ineffective and so forth, if if that all proves true, it seems like the market just wants to look through anything that might happen in the interim and continue to trade higher on speculation that, well, the vaccine's going to fix everything. The big risk would be if the vaccine assumptions prove false, if there is an evasion of the vaccine through mutation or some complication, or if the fact that these vaccines are brand new mRNA vaccine technology, which is uncharted territory, we've never had one before, there's never been a successful coronavirus vaccine for humans, we're doing all this new stuff, if anything goes wrong, that's not priced in, and meanwhile, just on a, a technical basis, the market is overbought. How long can it continue? I don't know. I, I've given up. 
All right. Well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar. It's perfect timing to have Jeffrey on because we've been talking for weeks about it consolidating along that 92 handle and kept asking the question, is it going to break? And well, I think we can decisively say it did. So what's your take on all of this? Well, we got our answer, that's for sure. And as we anticipated, as soon as you saw that daily close below 92, the floodgates opened from there. I've got a lot to say about the dollar this week. I don't want to steal Jeff's thunder, though. So let's wait until after the feature interview with Jeff Snyder and ask me again in the postgame segment. At that point, we can bring up some charts and really go into detail. But to give you the, the quick preview, I agree completely with Jeff on some things, but it's a question of time frames. There's other aspects of this that I see differently. Let's come back to it in the postgame segment. All right, Eric. Well, let's touch on crude oil because crude oil spent the entire week just consolidating, but it's back here at the 46 level on that January contract, and it looks like it wants to go higher. Do we have a, a punch up to $50 in store here? Oh, I definitely think that we do, Patrick. And as I've said before, I think based on the coronavirus situation, it's it's kind of doesn't make sense economically that this should be happening. But if I look at what the market is telling me, it is happening and it's accelerating. Now, as you say, the front month action on uh, the January contract looks pretty strong. But boy, the back of curve spreads look even stronger. And oftentimes those back of curve spreads are a, uh, a signal that tends to uh, presage what's about to happen in the front month. So I think a big move up is coming. Now, this week, it's all been about the OPEC Plus meeting. And it's kind of crazy, really, the way these things go. The big meeting was going to be to extend the production cuts, and that was on Monday. And then the end of Monday, well, uh, we need a little more time, but it's coming. We're, we're going to extend the production cuts, but we're going to extend the meeting into Tuesday. And then they canceled the Tuesday and said they needed more time. And then it was Thursday at 2 p.m. in Vienna, which would be 8 a.m in the United States Eastern Time. Well, let's start the meeting a little bit late. We're still having callway conversations about where this is headed. 3 p.m. Okay, we're going to have it. No, wait, you know, it kept changing. And then finally, what they came to, the press release was written backwards at first. And for a while, it actually looked like they were saying they were going to increase the amount of cuts that were going to occur. It's not really what they meant. They're, they're actually going to ease those cuts slowly. They're going to taper about 500,000 barrels per month, it looks like, is the plan. What's interesting to me, though, Patrick, is despite all of this uh, soap opera drama on the OPEC meeting all week, before, during, and after the OPEC meeting, those back-of-curve time spreads were trading higher and higher and higher and outperforming the front-month contract all the way. So the price action says to me that the market thinks that the OPEC meeting is just a formality. The cuts will be extended to the extent necessary. And especially at the back of the curve, which really is in that vaccine window, we're seeing some really, really significant growth there. And again, that oftentimes is a leading indicator of what's going to come next in the front month. With respect to inventory this week, crude oil drew down 679,000 barrels. Now, that was after API had projected a big build in inventory. So it was perceived by the market as a bullish surprise. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 317,000 barrels. The big builds were in finished products. Gasoline, building 3.5 million barrels. Distillates, building 2.3 million barrels. U.S. production, ticked up another 100,000 barrels to 11.1 .1 million barrels. And that's really going to bear watching because by some estimates from Art Berman and other people, you could see almost a halving of that in the next year, down to 5 or 6 million barrels from 11.1. .1. Now, that remains to be seen as to whether it's going to happen, but some of the estimates are that dramatic. And if that happens, boy, look for a big move up in prices. The outlook is mostly all positive. I really think very strongly that there's a lot of intermediate term economic risk, but the market's looking past it. And uh, we're seeing the, the strength of the 11 million barrels of U.S. production for now. If that really is to be cut in half in the next year, as some people are saying, that could be an extremely bullish input. So far, the data isn't showing any confirmation of that, but Art Berman told us not to expect it until the very end of the year. We're getting close to that, but so far, no confirmation. I am still long the Z1, Z2, that's the December 21 to December 22 time spread. 
our regular listeners remember I described that trade when the entry price was minus three spot twenty three dollars and twenty cents of contango back in May. It touched a high today over one spot thirty of backwardation. So minus three spot twenty to uh, plus one spot 30. Uh, I don't know exactly what that is, but it's a really big number for a time spread trade. Those of you who put that trade on when I first mentioned it back in May, feel free to send your donations to uh, Macro Voices for the the year end. Short-term downside risk is very real, I think, on the pandemic escalation, but the market is not pricing it that way. The market is just zooming to the upside and looks like it's set to continue. All right. Well, let's touch on gold because Monday it looked like uh, the world was ending for gold bulls and uh, suddenly we get this reflexive snaps. There's clearly a swing low of some sort at the bottom. I mean, we're $75, $80 off of those lows. But is this just uh, an oversold bounce or do you think that uh, gold may have put in a more meaningful bottom? Well, that's the big question on my mind. Uh, After we broke $1,800 last week, I said the next technical level to watch is $1,758. Then about a day later, our good friend Ola Hansen from Saxo Bank tweeted his number was $1,762. And I said, hmm, he's $4 off. I've got the right number. And boy, uh, Ola had literally called it right to the penny. It was $1,762 was the bottom. So good call, Ola. He nailed it. As far as is that it, boy, the bounce off of that really seems to have legs. It feels like maybe that was the end. But frankly, you know, if Bitcoin is struggling here, if my thesis is correct that Bitcoin strength is what's been causing gold weakness, Bitcoin is still struggling trying to break through its previous all-time high. It hasn't really decisively broken above it yet. I don't know if it's traded intraday above it, but if it did, it didn't last long. If it closes above its previous all-time high from back in 2018 and moves higher, I think there could be another leg down in gold. A lot of other smart people for different reasons saying the same thing. We had Jeff Christian from CPM Group had a video out this week saying he thinks another $100 down from the previous low down to 1650 or so might be in the cards. Marin Katusa has his subscription newsletter out this week with a similar forecast. I'm not going to reveal the details out of respect for Marin and his paying subscribers, but the same rough kind of numbers that Jeff Christian is talking about. Maybe another $100 down from the bottom that we just touched. Uh, Is that really going to happen? I think it's about Bitcoin. I think if Bitcoin breaks out to new all-time highs and keeps going, gold is probably going to make another wave down. But let's see. All right. Well, let's just finally touch on that 10-year treasury yield because over the last couple of days, we saw a considerable jump in uh, inflation expectations, break-evens, and it certainly created a, a reaction in the bond markets as we saw a jump in the yields. Right now, we're trading around the uh, spot 92 on the yield, but it really does look like it's rolling back up. Do you think we finally get above 1% on the yield? Well, I do think we're headed that direction. But what I find most interesting, Patrick, is I I think the trade is not just short the 10-year. It really is the curve steepener trade because not only are you seeing the 10-year backing up in yield, but, you know, look at the six-month T-bill now at at eight basis points. You know, we're really seeing uh, a lot of strengthening of prices, weakening of yields at the very short end of the curve. And the further you go out into duration, the more the rates are starting to back up. So uh, I think the steepener trade, and of course, remember Charlie McElligot's words, fear the steepener. What does this mean? Where are we headed? It'll be very interesting to see. This week's feature interview guest is Alhambra Investments CIO, Jeffrey Snyder. Now, Eric, why did we get Jeff back this week? Well, Jeff has had a very, very insightful view of how the offshore euro dollar system works, how U.S. dollar funding really occurs. And I think it's been incredibly instructive for me to understand a view that is very much at odds with what some people think. I used to be one of the the guys that was saying, oh, the U.S. dollar is going to crash. It has to. And it was really after I discovered Jeff's work that I stopped thinking that way. So with the technical signals suggesting that maybe we really are seeing the beginning of a very significant breakdown in the U.S. dollar index, I thought, boy, we really need to get Jeff back and find out whether his views have changed, how he sees this, and uh, you know what he thinks is coming next. So let's uh, listen in with Jeff, and I've got some more thoughts after the interview myself. Well, Eric's interview with Jeffrey Snyder is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. 
This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies, which also sponsors my new Smarter Markets podcast, which airs every Saturday morning and explores how the markets themselves could be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. My interview with billionaire financier Robert Friedland in the inaugural episode was a big hit with listeners, so if you missed it, I encourage you to give it a listen now. Just type Smarter Markets into whatever app you use to get your podcasts. This coming weekend, my guest on Smarter Markets will be oil industry veteran Mariam Ayati, and you won't believe the technology she'll tell you about that allows a digital fingerprint to be injected into almost any raw material. And then on December 12th, my guest will be Jeffrey Curry, global head of commodities research for Goldman Sachs. But you won't get the future Smarter Markets episodes on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe to Smarter Markets in order to receive this exciting new podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Alhambra Investments Chief Investment Officer Jeffrey Snyder. For newer listeners who are not familiar with Jeff, he's not only one of our most popular returning guests, but he's well known for his slide decks and the quality of his graphs and charts. So you're not going to want to miss the slide deck that accompanies today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your research roundup email. If you're not yet registered, just go to our macrovoices.com homepage, click the red button that says looking for the downloads just above Jeff's picture. Jeff, for years now, we've had quite a few other guests on Macro Voices tell us that the dollar was doomed. And the things they usually cite are that the government is printing money like it's going out of style, reckless spending, and they're saying eventually this has to lead to debasement of the dollar. You've been the lone voice saying, hey, guys, you know, the dollar is just as broken as you think it is, but it's broken in a very bizarre way where the mechanism for creating more dollars in the international market, the euro dollar system, is not creating dollars the way it's supposed to. And ironically, that's more likely to lead to dollar appreciation, effectively a short squeeze. For quite a bit of that time, Jeff, you were kind of proven right. Things were going more in the up direction for the dollar than down. But, you know, I think we've been here before and and we have it again. The dollar index is plumbing multi-year lows. It's been trading lower ever since May. Is this the beginning of that long forecasted dollar crash, which would eventually change your thesis? Well, you know, Eric, there may come a time when dollars exchange value is going to fall substantially. And I mean, everybody in the world, it seems, is doing everything they can to make it go lower from uh, politicians to central bankers. There's at least a realization today that a higher dollar value against most other currencies is bad for everyone on both sides of it. Now, that's a, that's a small bit of progress from when it was settled wisdom, how a rising dollar would mean something good, you know, the cleanest, dirty shirt or something like that. And that's never been the case, as you just pointed out. A rising dollar is really a, a dollar wrecking ball globally. You know, it's, it's the rest of it which is being so stubbornly difficult. How do we make it stop? How do we make the, the dollar stop rising? By every conventional account, what the Federal Reserve is doing should have been more than enough. And some claim that it is, as you just, as you just said, that the currency's movements over the last six months or so, that portends the beginning of this uh, you know, long-predicted collapse in the dollar and, and the dollar system. However, if if we examine the case for this theory, what we instead find are are answers for how the dollar rises, as well as why it's not at all likely we're seeing anything right now that represents a categorical change in its underlying conditions, the underlying monetary fundamentals. Okay, hang on, Jeff. Let's be specific about that. And you say underlying monetary fundamentals. What exactly fundamentals are we talking about? This usually begins with conjecture about money printing leading to substantial devaluation, currency wars, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's pretty much where the dollar crash is supposed to begin. So we'll start our our slide presentation on slide three. You know, you have an irresponsible central bank seeking to loosen the internal economy up with some inflationary currencies. On top of, you know, the textbook approach to beggar thy neighbor out of some economic rut. You know, it's the standard stuff. You print a bunch of money, devalue the currency, and you sit back and watch the export sector combined with the domestic inflation, and it washes away everyone's problems. 
And if it doesn't work, then that's where it can turn really ugly, right? I mean, I think that's pretty much what a lot of people are saying. Maybe the Fed has crossed a line, or if they haven't, they're very close to it with all the people talking about MMT and so forth. And and maybe, you know, trying to be too helpful, if you will, is risking the dollar status. Yeah, I think that's the point, right? The, it's it, and it's not just the Federal Reserve either. The federal government has played a, uh, played up to its presumed role in the dollar crash too. You know, unbelievable deficits, insane levels of cash, and on and on. You know, and with the dollar moving lower since around May, you know, these ingredients all featured prominent in it. Many people are thinking it can't possibly go any other way. You know, and there's a third element to this too, one that we hear a lot too. You know, the third parts of the fundamental story of the dollar crash, and that's the foreign rejection of all of these monetary excesses. You know, it's going to unleash something like the 1970s great inflation when countries around the world start speaking about being on the short end of the money printing stick. You know, places like China, a name that comes up time and again, you know, they aren't going to stand for it any longer, supposedly. You know, they'll figure out a replacement or or if they aren't going to, you know, there might be already on the cusp of a replacement and the dollar just won't fall. It'll crash down to zero. And then, of course, the Treasury market will go with it. Well, Jeff, I know you well enough to know that you're not buying the crash to zero part, at least. So first of all, we've heard both of these things for years, money printing leading to inflation and the insanity of the federal government leaving the world with too many treasuries and China and Russia actively working on some kind of rumored, but potentially a digital currency system that might be just around the corner. Yeah, so let's take these one at a time. And it all goes back to the money printing. That's where it really starts. If we go to slide four, you know, central banks, they adopt a QE or some other form of large scale asset purchase program, which leads to a radical increase in the size of the central bank's balance sheet. And by the necessity of central bank balance sheet accounting, it leads to a radical increase in the balance of reserves in the system, the so-called money printing. And as you pointed out, Eric, we've been hearing about this for years, decades. You know, we're hearing all about it again recently. Go to slide five. You know, for the better part of the last half year, that's all anyone is talking about again. Inflation, money printing, the Federal Reserve doing way too much. And that's just what Jay Powell actually wants. That's how monetary policy actually works, getting people to talk about inflation. And the reason he wants this is because in reality, there hasn't been any money printed whatsoever. The level of bank reserves has increased, sure, but are bank reserves effectively money? That's the question you have to ask, and it's the question you're not supposed to ask. Nor are you supposed to remember how we, you know, go back to 2009 and 2010. We had heard all of these same things before. Go to slide six. You know, Anna Schwartz of a monetary history fame, you know, her and uh, Milton Friedman wrote that famous book in 1963, famed monetarist in July 2009. She was arguing against Ben Bernanke's reappointment as Federal Reserve chairman because he crossed the line. You know, back then she said the same thing we hear now. You know, the balance sheet had exploded by trillions. You know, Marty Feldstein around the same time, another famous economist, said it was, you know, surefire inflation from that point forward. And he actually referenced both the Fed and the federal government being irresponsible, both of the first two items on our dollar crash wish list. You know, there was definitely drunken sailor levels of spending, you know, supposedly Weimar levels of money printing. And those were going to add up to something like 1979 levels of inflation, if not something worse. And then in November of 2010, along comes the second round of quantitative easing in the United States. You know, and, and somehow nobody bothered to really think about how if Ben Bernanke thought he needed to do a second QE, what that must have meant monetarily about the money printing effectiveness of the first one. Instead, most people assumed, well, if QE1 wasn't enough, and clearly it wasn't, they focused on how QE2 would cross that line if the second one would prove to be too much. Yeah, exactly. And that was really the pattern which got established and survives to this day, as we're just talking about. You know, once another QE comes out, everyone forgets about how the last one, which was advertised as it came out as the greatest, most awesome money printing ever, how it couldn't have been those things. If it had been, no repeat would ever have been needed. Rather, you know, our attention gets quite purposely pulled forward into the considering only what the next QE must be. You know, and back in November 2010, QE1 had already been forgotten, just as Ben Bernanke wished. Suddenly, the inflationary fears of QE2, but not the inflation itself, those were ignited by what happened later in 2010. You know, there was the, that famous open letter from the group of very prominent economists. I think it was called the E21. And I've got that on slide eight. You know, they wrote this letter to Ben Bernanke telling him, hey, stop, don't do the second QE before it was too late. 
you know, because it was, they said it was going to unleash inflation and wreck the dollar, even though, again, QE1 hadn't done either of those things because QE1 wasn't really money printing either. If I'm remembering my dollar history correctly, Jeff, this is also where the term currency wars showed up. It was right in that QE2 time frame that suddenly everybody was talking currency wars and competitive devaluation and so forth. Officials around the world were freaking out over Ben Bernanke going back to his printing press for a second time. And the second time, of course, was bigger than the first time. And that caused, frankly, a, a lot of really big reactions around the world. Yeah, I mean, Brazil's finance minister, Guido Mantega, who, in, you know, in late September of 2010, he's the one who actually said that, you know, Ben Bernanke wasn't just risking a currency war, as you can see in slide nine, that the currency war had already begun. You know, even though QE2 hadn't officially been announced until this, and voted on until the November, remember, it was at Jackson Hole in August of 2010, just a month before Mantega's currency war proclamation. That's when Ben Bernanke had affirmed the Fed's intent to start up a second round of QE. And listen, it, was, it wasn't just foreigners or even, you know, commentators like us talking about the, oh, this inflation and dollar crash and all that kind of stuff. You know, policymakers and staff at the Federal Reserve, they believed in this devaluation stuff wholeheartedly. If you go to slide 10, in November 2010, at the FOMC meeting, when the vote for QE2 was actually held, the committee heard the staff uh, present studies which very strongly suggested that theoretically QE could lead to a lower currency values. And if that there were or if there had been any benefits from QE from the first one, it had accrued almost entirely through the U.S. export channel. So very textbook stuff. OK, Jeff. So what you're saying is that in November of 2010, the FOMC was saying when they voted for QE2 that they fully expected that it would lead to a lower dollar and that it was going to produce the economic benefits that enhance the economy's growth potential to the point where it would become a legitimate recovery. Yeah, not just that, as you can see by this quote from Governor Ward, still on slide 10. They also discussed how the rest of the world should be happy about this. The Fed was going to push the dollar lower, not, not by actual money printing, but instead through how that was supposed to work through inflation expectations. And that would boost U.S. exports to get the economy, the U.S. economy growing again. And then that would lead the rest of the world out of its post-crisis rut. So if you go to slide 11, they absolutely expected and were absolutely counting on a lower dollar value being the major thrust of global economic recovery. And those first couple of years in the post-crisis period were very reminiscent of where we are right now. Everyone, I mean, everyone said inflation, lower dollars, definitely happening. You know, it was a done deal. And also like now, the dollar was falling at that time against most, most currencies. But the dollar was never really tanking, nor really at risk of tanking, not even back then, which really didn't fit the dollar crash narrative or the, you know, all the things that were supposedly going on with money printing. Nor were there any market indications that we were at risk of some major inflationary breakout. And then right when the dollar crash was supposed to really show up, right around early 2011 in the midst of QE2, instead the opposite took place. If you go to slide 12, the dollar spiked, treasury yields tanked, inflation expectations all dropped. You know, And these are all contrary changes, which show that the very least – there had to have been something huge missing from this you know, dollar crash, bond route, money printing, and inflationary story. Okay, Jeff, but the you know, end of 2010, early 2011, that was a full decade ago. I think the argument today is that central banks like the Fed have so far surpassed what they did back then. It's the size of the current money printing. Size matters that uh, a lot of people are now saying is going to lead to inflation in the dollar crash. Jay Powell's current QE dwarfs the size of Ben Bernanke's biggest QE. And, and uh, so, I, you know, I think the argument is these things keep getting bigger. How long can, can this go on that they just keep getting bigger? Yeah, and that's always the excuse, right? I call it the magic number theory, that QE is money printing works like money printing, except it's never enough money printing, right? I mean, no matter, its proponents always claim it will start working and maybe work too well once the central bank hits upon that exact right magic number, which we are told always has to be bigger than the last magic number, which in hindsight couldn't have been big enough, right? It's always bigger, bigger, bigger. And if you actually think about it, You'll already notice how it falsifies the entire QE premise. I mean, QE means quantitative easing, which already denotes that the central bank has is doing the quantifying, and therefore it must already know the right quantity of easing in order to produce the desired inflationary recovery results. 
So if, if there's any more than a single QE, then straight away you're alerted to the fact that, well, it, it couldn't have been quantitative, could it? Already something's, something's wrong and something's missing. And you're right, Eric, if you're a central bank and you've screwed up the number, you know, the size of the, the, the large scale asset purchase program, then merely change the size of it and give it a second try, you know, or a third or a fourth or a 24th as in Japan. You know, the magic number has to be in there somewhere, right? Here's the thing, though. Japan has already done this. They have did this massive upsizing. If you go to slide 13, many years ago, Japanese monetary officials quite purposefully designed what they called QQE to look and be as huge and irresponsible as humanly possible. The numbers were going to be so damn big, it wouldn't leave a single doubt. That was the whole point of QQE. So in technical terms, they said this was a credible promise to be irresponsible with money printing. The Bank of Japan would print so much money, so many Japanese yen bank reserves, and create them out of thin air, they wouldn't leave a single doubt. This was guaranteed to be inflationary because it was so big. Okay, I remember that was April of 2013. It was one of the big arrows of what was at the time called Abenomics. The Japanese said this was the new way of doing things and that central banks being, uh, I don't know if they use the word irresponsible, but if the central banks just went and printed and printed and printed on top of reducing the yen, there was no way that it could do anything other than snap Japan's economy out of what they said was its deflationary mindset. Yeah, QQE was the biggest of the big. It was so big, it was, you know, it was the, the QE to end all QEs. It was so huge, there was no possible way they, they wouldn't figure out the magic number because they were guaranteed to go way beyond that level. And once again, in the first few months, it looked like it was happening. Go to slide 14, inflation rates in Japan initially shot upward. They were boosted again in early 2014 by the effects of the VAT tax hike. And so Hiroshiku Kuroda's gambit seemed right on course right off the bat. But then, quite predictably, it very quickly fell apart. By October 2014, just a year and a half into QQE, they were suddenly making adjustments to it. Apparently, it wasn't big enough. It had to be bigger. What was supposed to have been the most irresponsible money printing ever conceived, apparently, again, needed to be even more irresponsible. So the, and the, you know, and the adjustments to QQE just never stopped because, as you can see on these slides, inflation didn't do what they said it would. Rather than surge into some new growth paradigm with positive inflation above the central bank target, prices began to fall right back into deflation. Go to slide 15. So, you know, QQE was boosted in early 2016 with now negative interest rates, NERP policy. And then in September 2016, the Bank of Japan said they were now going to let inflation go above and stay above their target for an extended period of time, what they called overshooting, as you can see on slide 16. Okay, now that sounds really familiar. Didn't the Federal Reserve just come out recently with average inflation targeting, which also states that the FOMC is going to let inflation go above and stay above the Fed's target for as long as it takes to balance out this period of low inflation? Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute, but you're absolutely right, Eric. You know, that's a major point I'm trying to make here. Everything that the Fed has done is doing or will ever try was first tried out in Japan. And I mean everything. As you can see here very plainly how this overshooting policy combined with ungodly huge QQE money printing in Japan, it accomplished next to nothing. If you go to slide 17, like before, consumer prices accelerated modestly in 2017, which fooled the Bank of Japan and quite a few other people into thinking in early 2018 that it was in reach of its economic goals of inflation and recovery. And that's the other excuse that's always made for QEs, right? If it's not the right magic number or the right size, then it, then it must not have been given long enough period of time to work. You know, Again, this, this QE stuff, this money printing stuff supposedly works. If you give it enough time and figure out the right quantity, when the name itself conveys those things have been figured out beforehand. So you know, it's, it's awful fickle in a way that sounds nothing like straightforward money printing. Instead, just like before, despite QQE plus the negative interest rates plus this policy of overshooting the inflation target, it didn't happen, did it? No, and it wasn't even close. You know, by the end of 2018, if you go to slide 18, consumer price gains were again decelerating all over. You know, CPI rates were falling and they kept dropping all the way through 2019. And the overshooting policy that had referenced the core CPI, which is the CPI in Japan, not including uh, fresh food prices, you know, the Bank of Japan said in 2016 when it revealed this 
overshooting policy, that it expected this this core CPI rate would not only rise above 2%, they would let it remain above 2% in a stable manner. So go above 2% and then stay above 2% for a long time. In reality, it only ever got at most halfway, if you, as you can see on slide 19, the core CPI reached just 1%, and that was only in three months out of 50 since the policy was unveiled. Three out of 50, and those three were only halfway to the target. Yeah, it's just three out of 50 at just 1%. You know, so the other 47 months were less than 1% and, and often substantially less than 1%. So, you know, forget 2%, forget anything above 2%. And it's just laughable, the idea of staying above 2% for any length of time, even as at the same time, the Bank of Japan's balance sheet shoots up toward a quadrillion you know, they surpassed half a quadrillion and they're closing in on three quarters of a quadrillion now. So, you know, more importantly, though, this this year, the Bank of Japan, like other central banks around the world, they've re-energized QQE. If you go to slide 20, you know, the, the central bank's balance sheet is again expanding and expanding now at a rate that exceeded what it was doing back in the early QQE days. You know, the alleged money printing binge is now back and back to another higher magic number, or at least, you know, what officials hope this time. This time, that will be the magic number. And what, again, most people are claiming, well, this time they can't possibly miss because there's just so much of it going on. And quite predictably, once again, inflation has become outright deflation. Not only that, in terms of the core CPI, again, the core CPI is what the, the Bank of Japan is using as their measurement tool. It's become entrenched deflation where for this core CPI in the month of October 2020, at least, it turned out to be the worst level of broad consumer price retreat in almost in almost a decade, going back to 2011. So this policy of overshooting, the greatly expanded level of QQE money printing, negative interest rates, all that huge monetary stuff, the financial media, they always describe as ultra loose and ultra accommodative. And Japan is right back in deflation anyway. Jeff, without at least a small uptick in inflation rates, the yen probably isn't going anywhere either. I mean, that's the other part of this, right? The currency debasement expectation. Huge amounts of reckless money printing is supposed to, in this case, wreck the yen. Yeah, absolutely. And it never happened either, right? You know, the yen had fallen when Abinomics was announced back in 2012. But by and large, while QQE and all these other policies have been ongoing, the yen is on a decidedly upward trajectory, as you can see on slide 21. You know, and it's right around the same exchange value today against the dollar as it had been when QQE was starting up in April 2013. And it's materially higher than it was back in 2008 before this searching for the magic number of QEs restarted in early 2009. So no inflation, no debasement. It didn't matter one bit the scale, the size of the money printing or how long these things were strung out to the point you really start to question what really is a simple premise. If you go to slide 22. If QE equals money printing, as everyone says, and money printing always leads to inflation, as history has conclusively established, then how can QE not equal inflation? Either history is wrong about that, which is not likely at all, or QE just isn't money printing. Those are the only two options. And it's not like we don't have a sufficient sample size here. It's been empirically and experimentally established all over the world using all sorts of different parameters. Like we were just saying, you know, again, in the, U in the U.S. monetary policy, it has closely followed the Japanese example, as you can see on slide 23. From borrowing QQ initially, now in 2020, the Fed program that is pretty much the same thing as QQE, which is massive QE, buying different asset classes and things like that, and also implementing this overshooting policy, which in May 2018, the Fed adopted and called a symmetrical inflation target, which was merely updated this year in August of 2020 by calling it average inflation targeting. You know, it doesn't matter. In all these cases, it works out to exactly the same. There's never any inflation. So that's true in more places than Japan. We hear about this excessive liquidity and money printing, but no out-of-control consumer prices anywhere. In fact, inflation indices, at least, whatever you make of them, you, some people think that they're not very accurate, they indicate lower inflation today than in the pre-crisis period. Yeah, and it's uniformly that way everywhere. The U.S. case is actually the best case in that inflation hasn't been as negative or stayed as low as it has in places like Japan. But even so, you know, where's the money printing? It's just not happening. You know, it's not coming out in the consumer prices you can see on slide 24. And as you said, Eric, on the contrary, there was far more inflation and on a sustained basis before 2008, before the, the euro dollar system broke down, when the Fed practically did nothing. All the Fed did in the pre-crisis era was move the federal funds rate around here and there a quarter point 
you know, a little bit at a time and then claiming credit for what they said was a great moderation. And then after 2008, the Fed expanded its balance sheet massively, you know, several QEs, trillions in bank reserves and inflation and economic growth, you know, where those have been concerned, we don't get much of either of those things. So the more the Fed does, the less it seems it accomplishes. So we're missing something here. And that's really the important point about inflation. It's not really about consumer prices. So even in 2020, despite what's supposed to have been a biblical level of flood of digital money printing, there isn't even the slightest hint of inflation pressures. Instead, there are quite a few growing indications of not just disinflationary pressures, but as we saw in October CPI and PCE deflator numbers here in the United States, the balance of probabilities are far more tilted toward deflation like Japan right now. So we might not have inflation today, but could we see higher inflation down the road after all of this record government and central bank activity? Yeah, and it's not just right now, right? It's you know the current month or, or today. If you go to slide 25, if we look at forward-looking markets such as tips and inflation break-evens or long-run inflation expectations, it's same thing, you know, zero, zilch, not a nothing. Inflation expectations right now in the bond market remain on the side of historical lows far more than they are trending even toward average inflation rates. So the bond market inflation expectations, as well as, you know, nominal yields and, you know, the treasury market and curves and money curves and things like that, they have shown that especially since going back to early 2013, there just isn't anything inflationary or even increasing growth to expect from these QEs and QQEs. That's quite the coincidence here. You've got circled U.S. inflation expectations peaking in February of 2013, which is right around when QQE was started up in Japan. At the same time, the Federal Reserve, as your chart shows, was full throttle on QE3 at that time, or what you say was QE4, or QE3 and QE4. I'm not sure which. Yeah, and most people say there were only three QEs up to that point when there actually were four before 2014. And, you know, you're right, Eric. The market at that time had sniffed out those last two, QE3 and QE4 in the U.S., how they just weren't going to lead to any rise in inflation. And it never happened. It's still not happening. So the bond market unequivocally tells you this isn't money printing. At least it's not inflationary currency. And you can go over to Europe, too, as we do on slide 26, and you find exactly the same things there. There's no correlation whatsoever between what the media calls money printing, you know, these huge increases in bank reserves that everyone can see, and the levels of consumer price increases. In fact, right now, just like in Japan, in Europe, the ECB has gone absolutely crazy, absolutely nuts in this year with a huge amount of QE. And also like Japan, inflation rates are now deflation rates in Europe. So even the core inflation rate in Europe, which remains just barely on the plus side of zero, even though it's still positive for the last two months running, these are the lowest core inflation rates on record in Europe. So, you know, it's not just... QQE isn't money printing. It can't be money printing. It's Again, if money printing leads to inflation, then QE or QQE, whatever you want to call it, isn't money printing. Okay. So let's net this down to going back to your list of factors for a potential dollar crash. You're basically, all of this is just to say you're unequivocally crossing the first one off, money printing. Yeah. So slide 27. You know, there is no magic number of bank reserves or, or central bank balance sheet side. There is no long enough period of time for QE. It's 100 percent empirically established. There's no relationship between the central bank balance sheet expansion and increase in bank reserves and then consumer price increases or accelerates. It's just it just doesn't exist. So, you know, we've got we've got 12 years of that in the West. We've got nearing 20 years of this stuff, you know, this money printing bank reserves in Japan. We've got a range of all sorts of geographies, all kinds of variations in the programs, different lengths, different asset classes being targeted, variations in monthly rates, et cetera. You know, you name it. QE has been tested to death. There really is no doubt about it, except that Everyone still says it's money printing, except that, you know, that's not really a basis for realistic analysis. And so you have to ask why, what's missing? The only conclusion is that it can't be money printing at all. Okay, Jeff, but the argument you're making here is that the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing isn't really the same thing as money printing the way most people think it is. Fair enough. But look, the federal government could still crash the dollar. I mean, that, that's the next factor on your list, isn't it? Deficit spending so big that there's just not enough buyers for all those treasury securities that they have to issue in order to pay for the deficit spending. That could lead to a loss of confidence. And, you know, you know the rest of the story. It's a self-reinforcing, vicious cycle that leads to a collapse of the currency. 
Yeah, and, and this is another one we've heard several times, you know, like the QE inflation criticisms of the early post-crisis period. There was, you know, as I pointed out with Marty Feldstein's article from, you know, April 2009, you know, there was a wave of warnings back then about government borrowing being too much in the early Obama administration. And it was the same story then as now. You know, the scale of deficits in 2009, 2010, they were nothing like we had ever seen before, not since World War II. And ultimately, that didn't really matter either. You know, same thing in Japan going back to the 1990s. You know, in Japan, the fiscal recklessness, you know, that was always by design. It was never an accident. So that along with zero interest rates and these QEs, again, in Japan, no inflation, no, no destruction of the yen, no legitimate recovery, none of those things either. And now, of course, this year, we've got even bigger deficits in borrowing in the United States, which, again, as you pointed out, leads many people to assume – there's some line or threshold or magic number that will cross, which will trigger the market to begin first rejecting treasury paper, then ultimately the dollar, as I'm showing on slide 28, 29, and 30. Well, that's not new either, Jeff. I mean, even in recent times, we heard pretty consistently ever since the tax reform took place in December of 2017, we were hearing that that was going to lead to a big increase in the fiscal deficit. And it did. That most certainly had that effect. But we were also told that was going to create the problem of too many treasuries, and that would presumably, you know, if there's too many treasuries, there's not enough demand, interest rates are going to start to run away to the upside. But it never happened. They never really rose that much. And today, obviously, they're still lower, substantially lower, just like the dollar is substantially higher. Yeah, you know, Eric, the, the too many treasury argument never made too much sense to me. It was demonstrably false, actually, <laughs> you know, only starting with the correlation to the rising dollar. As I'm showing you on these slides, 20, 29, and 30, you know, demand for U.S. treasury paper, rising dollar indicating too few dollars globally rather than too many treasuries. You know, that was the, that was the major point. Most of this argument centered on how the banking system was being stuck, supposedly, with treasury securities that we were told it didn't want or couldn't adequately absorb. And that was just false. And, and it's established here by the market prices over a very long period of time. You know, at no time were the results of a single treasury auction indicative of anything other than over demand, for lack of a better term. Even if foreign buyers weren't bidding as much as they had been, which was true, though for reasons of a dollar shortage rather than any kind of distaste for, for dollars or government deficits, you know, primary dealers were consistently more than willing to buy up each and every bond, note, and bill anyway. So when a global dollar shortage shows up, as we saw in early 2018, coincident to the deficit rising after tax reform, you know, that's why inflation never shows up and why QEs are worthless and ineffective, because it's really good business to be in the U.S. Treasury auction business, even if foreigners, you know, the indirect bids disappear from the auctions. Dealers, primary dealers, these bank dealers know there's a tremendous value to that auctioned off treasury paper, value which is only enhanced by a global dollar shortage. So dealers are going to bid for it up to position limits in, in some of the non-competitive bids for their own house accounts in the sense of their bank book, which is holding the securities to maturity, therefore betting on the price going higher, or their bid for them at auctions for what their brokerage network is telling them they can sell off easily to the public at even higher prices. Or for reasons that have more to do with survival in, in, in terms of repo collateral. And that means stockpiling the best on the run securities in their house accounts for their own purposes or intending to profit off the survival risks of others who they believe are going to find themselves short of on the run collateral in the near future. Either way, that's what Treasury auctions have been saying this whole time over the last couple of years, including all of 2020 so far. Not that there's too many treasuries, but there's not enough. Even if dealers were taking on more securities than they had ever wanted to, they knew without a doubt they could easily sell them to the public that demands them at almost any price. There was never any danger of there being too many treasuries. Well, and that's also been true of recent auctions, not just before 2020, but also treasury auctions taking place more recently. Yeah, even as yields have increased modestly since August, you know, very modestly, the auction fundamentals remain as solid as ever as dealers buy up whatever is being supplied. And of course, you know, the amount being supplied is far greater than anything we've seen since World War II. So obviously surpassing what was done in 2009 and 2010, which triggered all of those fears back then. And, you know, and that part is absolutely true. The federal government is borrowing in excess of anything we've ever seen before. 
Some people claim that's just QE, the Fed buying treasuries to rescue the market. I mean, obviously, if the Fed's buying the treasuries, then, you know, there's going to be somebody to buy them because the Fed is artificially there creating that artificial demand or to monetize the debt. You know, doesn't that account for why we're not seeing this, this lack of a bid in treasuries? Well, yeah, yeah, but the auctions still work out the same way as they did before. The price is the price, right? Not a single indication of lack of demand. And that has nothing to do with the Fed, especially since the Fed quite intentionally stayed out of the bill market auctions, which is where most of that huge increase in borrowing was done at auction. The private banking system easily absorbed those several trillion in T-bills while the Fed was focused, <laughs> for reasons it didn't really understand, in the stale off-the-run bonds and notes. Plus, you know, there's no way dealers are going to depend on the Fed and QE to bail them out of a situation they don't want to be in. That's not what keeps them coming back at auction and certainly not what's driving private non-dealer demand for treasuries. As I said, all the data shows conclusively there's no inflation risk from QE and the global dollar shortages that are treasury price positive. So if QE isn't money printing, what would that mean so far as the dollar shortage goes or the risk of a dollar crash or the, you know, the end of the so-called treasury bond bull market? If you go to slide 31, you know, every time we hear about these things, how inflation is going to kill the dollar and end the bond bull, the dollar somehow higher, interest rates somehow lower than the last time we heard all of these same things. You know, whether it's auction data, market data, inflation data, the banking system is is consistently telling you that these things are not happening and they don't expect it. They're not expected to happen. You know, that there's something else other than QE because bank reserves aren't money printing. There's other things going on that you don't see that you have to pay attention to. Okay, Jeff, but if U.S. dollar inflation, or I guess more specifically, the devaluation of the U.S. dollar isn't something that we need to be worried about, then why do we keep hearing about the dollar being replaced as the reserve currency? I mean, you've got all kinds of foreign leaders making outspoken statements that they need to find an alternative to the U.S. dollar in order to replace its role at the center of the global monetary system. That's true, too, isn't it? I mean, and, and maybe QE isn't money printing, and maybe uh, it doesn't matter right now today that the U.S. government is drunk on spending, but foreigners are saying they're not happy about the fact that the U.S. dollar is still the global reserve currency. What's their reasoning? You know, if it's not currency wars, if that's not it, why do we have foreign governments saying they're looking for an alternative? And, and I mean, a lot of governments are saying they're looking for an alternative. You've got China actually working hard to introduce a digital currency alternative, which they haven't quite come out and said they want to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. But I'm convinced that that's their agenda. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> In fact, you know, the reason that the that everybody's not happy with the dollar is because there's a dollar shortage, not the valuation. Go to slide 32. That's a form of malfunction which harms the global economy, just not in an inflationary way. And, and you know, these governments around the world can look at their own economy and say, things are not right here. We know the dollar's the big problem for it. You know, it's actually worse than that. You know, the entire global economy gets harmed by these dollar shortages. The US in part of it too. But it's way worse overseas, especially since 2011. And that's the period when the dollar has risen the most. If you actually listen to what foreign officials are saying, at least what I think they're saying, that's what they're really talking about. The dollar system doesn't work. And even if they don't specifically know exactly why or what the problem actually is, they can tell it has nothing to do with currency wars because there aren't any currency wars because there isn't any devaluation. There's something wrong with the dollar. We don't know what it is, but it, it's a dollar system that doesn't work. But what we know is that, you know, this, this dollar shortage is the only thing that comes and goes. You know, it gets worse. The dollar rises. The global economy suffers. Then it gets a little bit less worse. There's a reflationary period. The dollar falls a little bit as it's doing now. But that's entirely different from a dollar crash, especially these times when the global economy seems like it's getting better. But we can tell even foreign politicians and central bankers can tell there's something not right with the dollar system. You know, the dollar can go lower against a broad range of currencies, but it never seems to crash like right now. You know, the global economy looks like it is rebounding or picking up, but even foreign officials understand it's not the same thing as recovery because it never accelerates into a full inflation and full recovery. You know, this dollar shortage never stops, which is the primary reason why we keep hearing about the dollar system being replaced. And as you go to slide 33, I use one proxy for the global dollar system and what must be going on in it using Treasury International Capital data of the banking system. You know, and it's, it's the symptoms of this ongoing shortage that draws the ire of foreign officials who can make out at least this obvious correlation. 
when the dollar rises or goes higher or stays higher, it's just bad for everyone. Okay, now it sounds to me like what we're really coming back to here, Jeff, is a topic that you went in incredible detail in in a series we did with you a few years ago called Euro Dollar University. And listeners, it's uh, way too much to get into right now because it, it's hours of content, but it's still free of charge at macrovoices.com forward slash edu. What that series is about, Jeff, is a part of the monetary system, which we know is there. Milton Friedman and a lot of other famous people have told us it was there. They've been telling us that for decades. But it's kind of hard to see, and that's the part that's causing the problems. I know you've used the term shadow money before. What are we talking about here? Yeah, it's almost impossible to see. There's no direct observations of what's going on in the euro dollar system. You know, it's this enormous offshore dollar money system. And it performs the roles of the global reserve currency system. And, and nobody monitors it. We have really no idea what's going on there. The only way we can tell what's going on is because we look at markets and, and try to piece together a coherent picture of what the markets, the banking system, which actually operates the euro dollar system, what they are telling us must be going on in these shadow places we can't directly observe. And that's why it's been so very confusing. Because the public sees the central bank create trillions of bank reserves, and everyone's told those bank reserves are based money, therefore this must be money printing. But no one knows about the shadow system where bank reserves don't really matter, and you can't see the deflationary money tightness, which is why we never get inflation nor legitimate levels of economic growth and recovery. So you see the one thing and think it has to be inflationary, but you never see what actually matters, except you know if you're paying close attention to the bond market and some other uh, signals. And that's, that's what produces this constant deflationary drag that, that pushes the dollar higher and higher over time. And that's also what foreign officials have realized since especially 2011. That's what they actually need to be concerned about. Jeff, before we go on, I just want to mention for any newer listeners that we have, what we're talking about here. First, a lot of people think that money is created by the government. Really, that's not true. Money is created by the private banking system. It gets lent into existence, and that's a very well-known fact. Nobody disputes it. What's not nearly as well-known is that when all of the monitors and controls that show you the money creation that's occurring in the private banking system, they're only tracking the operations that are occurring in the United States where they have to report what they're doing. Jeff's entire argument for the euro dollar system centers on the idea that international banks are creating U.S. dollar money supply. They're, they're literally bringing new U.S. dollars into existence. And that system is one that very few people, even in professional finance, fully understand. Strongly encourage anyone who's interested in that to check out our free euro dollar university at macrovoices.com forward slash edu. Sorry for that little PSA, Jeff. I, I think we left off. You were talking about officials. Are we including China and Chinese officials in that category? Yeah, I am. I think if you listen to what they've been saying for years now, it's that the dollar system just doesn't work for China, not just China, but for anyone else. And it's the rising dollar, dollar shortage problem. And the real problem is that you can't just flip a switch and replace the dollar by fiat decree, pun intended. It just doesn't work that way. Again, it's really hard to picture because this is, again, a shadow system, but it's an enormous system. It's made up of interlocking, sophisticated, and dynamic marketplaces, which many decades ago, as you just pointed out, Eric, were correctly, it blurred the lines between raw money and credit and debt usage. So we have this you know, massive infrastructure. It's, it's unimaginably complex that arose over a period of many decades, which undertook the true roles of a global reserve currency. And it's just not something you can replicate overnight or even in just a few years. So if you go to slides 34, 35, and 36, you know, I think that's why Yi Gang, who's the current head of the People's Bank of China, he has been very consistently arguing for the IMF's SDRs to be worked into a more prominent global monetary role, including this year. He's realizing that, it, you know, first of all, it will take years of concerted effort to even get to that point. Maybe we might even be able to think about SDRs having a sufficient system behind it in order to take on some of the global reserve chores. And that's why in late 2020, more than a dozen years after the first global shortage showed up in August of 2007, we're still here talking about QEs. We're still talking about why there'll never be inflationary, why the dollar only goes higher over time, you know, not always in a straight line, and why the global economy can never seem to get its footing. It's because there isn't any legitimate euro dollar reserve replacement on the horizon. For one thing, 
hardly anyone knows what the real reserve currency is. As you just said, Eric, you know, the euro dollar, most people have never even heard of that term. And there's even fewer people, even if, if some who have heard the term euro dollar, about how it actually takes place and how it gets done. This euro dollar system simply sticks around because there is no replacement for it. So what happens instead is we periodically hear about how this or that is going to challenge the dollar because what's really evident is that there's massive dissatisfaction for it. Something like the Petro Yuan, right? That was supposed to have been a game changer as far as changing the U.S. dollar status. Yeah, and it's kind of funny how when, when that debuted, the Petro Yuan, in March of 2018, as I showed on slide 37, and within two weeks or so, the dollar began its latest leg upward. You know, whatever the Petro Yuan was supposed to have meant so far as CNY and China taking a larger role in the global reserve, you know, pricing oil in a local currency – it was all quite predictably and easily superseded by the last dollar shortage, which began around the exact same time. You know, that's the thing which undermines and underlines everything else. Deflation versus inflation, rising rates versus falling rates, higher dollar or dollar drifting somewhat lower versus the dollar crash, which, you know, never happens. It won't so long as nothing in the euro dollar system materially changes. And that's really the whole point here. Ever since August 9th of 2007, this dysfunctional euro dollar system has been the only constant. QEs come and go. They get amped up. You know, there's hysterical shrieks about dollar crashes and the death of the treasury market. But just like Japan, so long as the shadow money system remains this way, there's absolutely no indication it's changing to something else. This is what rules our dollar crash list. So if you go to slide 38, number one, QE isn't money printing because shadow money of which bank reserves don't help and don't really count – it's the shadow money that counts. That's the shadow money that rules the system. So it's not, it's not what you see on a central bank's balance sheet that matters. It's what you don't see that does. Number two, while it is absolutely true the federal government has gone absolutely crazy, ridiculously crazy, you know that's not something to worry about today because global dollar shortage, liquidity risks remain paramount over some future reckoning with the credit risks of that ridiculous spending. So the demand for the safest, most liquid assets can go on and on, and that includes dollars as reserves, as it has for over a dozen years, so long as the deflationary shadow euro dollar system remains as the global reserve currency basis. The federal government is taking advantage of that deflationary condition. And so long as there is that deflationary condition to take advantage of, and if all we're given is worthless, useless QEs one after another – the federal government will continue to be able to take advantage of deflationary conditions. And the third thing, finally, you know, a global reserve currency just cannot be replaced by decree or by wishing it. It's not a matter of political will either. It's, it's first and foremost a technical matter that's just way beyond the capabilities of economists and central bankers to apparently comprehend. That's why they keep repeating QEs. You know, monetary scholarship, I mean, you have to realize monetary scholarship, actually looking at the monetary system, that dried up half a century ago. Economists and their DSG models, they pay no attention whatsoever to this stuff. And so, you know, that's not something you can just get back overnight and become technically proficient in a very short period condensed space. And even though 2008 was 12 years ago, in the dozen years since then, there's only been small, isolated, you know, really half-hearted efforts to try to really figure out what's going on out there. So changing a reserve currency requires massive effort, years of planning, at the very least some widespread recognition that there is a problem or what that problem actually is. And we aren't anywhere close to any of those things. And that's why here in 2020, you know, after so many years, after a decade of hearing about how, for example, the Chinese are going to take out the dollar, the euro dollar system remains unchallenged, leaving you know, nothing more than Yi Gang and the PBOC to fruitlessly plead its case about SDRs or something else. Okay, Jeff, I have to be honest. I'm still having a hard time with parts of this. Now, first, I want to credit you. You've made an extremely, extremely coherent, you know, wisely stated argument for why QE, as was implemented in Japan, as was introduced to U.S. monetary policy by Ben Bernanke and then expanded upon by Janet Yellen, that's not really money printing that pumps money into the real economy. What that is, is the creation of excess bank reserves. And I think you've made the point very well that people have misunderstood that and assumed it was inflationary when it wasn't. And I agree with you on that. But hang on a second here, Jeff. I recently interviewed Stephanie Kelton, 
Professor Stephanie Kelton is one of the most outspoken proponents in the public policy space of the prescriptions of modern monetary theory. Now, Stephanie Kelton is not talking about more QE for the purpose of creating more bank reserves. She's talking very openly, and and I think she understands very much what she's saying. She's saying, look, we need to essentially monetize government spending. We need to print more money for the purpose of dramatically increasing social support programs, infrastructure spending, doing more things to pump more money out into the real economy and use the ability of the federal government to print more money in order to accomplish those things. That's not bank reserves in the Ben Bernanke or Kurodasan style of QE. That's outright debt monetization or spending monetization, however you want to call it. And by the way, Professor Stephanie Kelton has the ear of a lot of politicians, especially on the Democratic side of the aisle, which is now taking power. So it seems to me like, okay, you make a good point about what's happened before, Jeff, but what about what's coming? Aren't we headed toward, uh, I don't know if you want to call it QE, but aren't we headed toward money printing that really is money printing? (laughs) <laughs> and that makes sense, right? I mean, if the problem is that we have a, a, a block that's the banking system, right? Because that's what the Fed does. The Fed conducts all its activity with the banking system. That's where the bank reserves go. That's where the, the, the quote unquote money printing of QE, that's where it ends up. And so if the banking system is ultimately the problem, then why not just go around it, right? Let's screw the banking system, screw the central banks. We'll just take the government and, and do the money printing directly with the people. And that sounds like it should be inflationary, sounds like it should be more effective, but we have to keep in mind, and I don't know Stephanie Kelton from anything, so you know I don't want to put words into her mouth or, or make it a direct case against her, but these MMT proponents are just as clueless about how the monetary system actually works as central bankers. And really what they're proposing is we're going to just take the central bank model and redevelop it for the Treasury Department. So we're going to do all this money printing stuff. We're going to have our DSG models and we're just going to supplant them from the, we're going to take them from the central bank and put them in in the treasury department. And why would anybody thinks that's going to work out any better is beyond me because you have the same people who don't understand how the global, especially the global end of the monetary system works. And I don't believe anybody in MMT has ever talked about Euro dollars and replacing the Euro dollar system globally. So if you're going to start pumping dollars into the U S economy, what's going to happen to them in terms of their international existence, in terms of their international conditions. And so what you have is essentially what sounds really good on paper, what sounds really good, like it's making progress and moving in the right direction, but is functionally, technically, practically worthless in the same way that central banks operate today. Because central bankers believe they know what they're doing too. And they're economists, just like I would presume Stephanie Kelton is, and most of the MMT proponents are as well. You know, they have complex mathematical equations which tell them this is what's going to work when, in fact, those complex mathematical equations aren't worth the uh, computer space that they're put into. And so it's not really a matter of are they going to be printing money and moving it into the real economy? It's the mechanism by which they do so. So we have a flawed banking system that won't do it now. Why would we think that the Treasury Department will be any better than the central bank at at performing this, what essentially is a monetary redistribution role, which, by the way, is the exact reason the banking system took over the monetary role way back in the 50s and 60s, because that's what the banking system does. It's a redistribution okay, mechanism. Hang on a second. You're, ask, you're answering a different question than the one that's on my mind. You're answering the question of will what Stephanie Kelton wants to do work and achieve the goals that she has in mind? That's not my question. My question is, will doing what she wants to do crash the U.S. dollar because it's not money because it really is money printing right. this time around. I don't think it is money printing, number one. And number two, it, it, you have to consider any kind of feedback effects. What happens to the existing system if the Treasury starts to, to, to do digital money printing, as, as you say? And I don't think it'll ever work out to, that way anyway, because you knew now we're introducing a political component into what should be an economic, purely economic matter. And I know you can argue that that's, that's, the, that's essentially what central banks are as well. But that's my point is you're not really doing anything that's much different. You're trying a different redistribution channel than what we do today, what central bankers do now. And so I don't think it will lead to an inflationary eruption that destroys the dollar. And by the way, the market doesn't believe so either. Again, we don't see anything in inflation expectations. And as you know, everybody is well aware that MMT has become a very popular topic in political conversations, but yet the markets aren't trading as if it's any any kind of realistic threat. Now, whether they believe that MMT actually comes out and, and is anything that happens, 
or whether it's just not going to be effective. That's, you know, maybe that's a different question. But I think overall right now, from what we understand and what we know, there's really nothing, you know, MMT doesn't really change much. It changes the way we want this top-down model to work, or at least the way proponents want it to work, but I don't think it actually changes the functionality of it. And so that doesn't, to me, describe the recipe for a dollar crash. It just describes more different ways to, to fail at the same level. Well, Jeff, we're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. I can't thank you enough for another terrific interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Uranium, the fuel for nuclear power, is a contrarian investment whose returns are historically uncorrelated to other asset classes. Low uranium prices lasted for many years after the Fukushima meltdown, leading to substantial supply destruction. At today's prices, uranium mining is uneconomical even for the world's lowest cost producers. Uranium demand is already estimated to exceed existing supply, and future demand growth is expected. New mines aren't economically viable at today's prices, leading analysts to predict that the price of uranium may need to double to over $60 per pound to incentivize sufficient new mine supply to meet expected demand. The NYSE-listed North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, offers investors exposure to both miners and holders of uranium. For more information, visit urnmetf.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it's always awesome to have Jeffrey come back and kind of give us some more insights on the euro dollar markets and how things have developed. You know, it really inspired me to put together a, a chart book just talking about where we stand on so many of these different cross currencies. I'm looking forward to getting to it. But at the, in the market wrap, you uh, alluded to the fact that you had some comments that you wanted to make on the dollar index as we got into this post game. What was on your mind? Patrick, the first thing I want to say is I agree emphatically with Jeff Snyder about the history of how we got here. A lot of people, myself included, misunderstood how QE really works. And I I credit Jeff for teaching me a lot of the intricacies of why QE is not money printing, as a lot of people think it is, and why it, it doesn't have the inflationary implications that a lot of people, myself included, thought that it did. So I couldn't agree more with Jeff on those points. And I think that what you heard in today's interview in terms of an assessment of how we got here, what happened, what the uh, interactions have been between the dollar and policy and so forth, I think Jeff's got it spot on. The thing is, that's how we got here. The question is, what happens next? Now, as Jeff said in today's interview, we really haven't seen true money printing. QE just creates bank reserves. It's not spending and monetizing government spending the way a lot of people think it is. Well, here's my counter to that. If there's anyone on this planet who has my confidence to figure out how to really and truly cause significant downside in the U.S. dollar with genuine bona fide money printing, not just bank reserves, but real honest-to-goodness money printing. It's Professor Stephanie Kelton. And I'm not saying that sarcastically, Patrick. I don't mean in any way to disrespect Professor Kelton. I think if she were here, she would tell us, well, yes, indeed, devaluing the U.S. dollar is to Stephanie Kelton and the other people who subscribe to this uh, school of thought around modern monetary policy. That's the whole idea. That's the objective of what they want to accomplish. They believe that that should be the goal. And uh, I think it's already starting to work for them. So even though I agree completely with Jeff Snyder about how we got here, uh, I think that as we look ahead, we have to expect that there's going to be a whole new generation of money printing. It's not going to be bank reserves. And I think it could be very, very U.S. dollar bearish. 
So uh, I, I think this might be the beginning of something really big. And it's not to disagree with Jeff. It's just Jeff was talking in this interview mostly about how we got here and how things really work. As far as what happens next, I'm more interested in the politicians and whether or not they embrace Stephanie Kelton's views and really go to full bore modern monetary theory and lots and lots of deficit spending and outright monetization of government spending. That's going to change the game completely. Let's move on, though, to the slide deck, Patrick. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads just above Jeff Snyder's picture on the homepage. Uh, Patrick, here on page two, boy, look at in just one week, the U.S. dollar index has taken a nosedive. What's going on here? Well, that that was that major support line that we've been highlighting in numerous chart decks in the, over the last month and talking about how critical of a line it is. And really, it was like an edge of a cliff. And when the dollar broke below that level, it became very clear that it was time for the, the dollar to go to the next level. And what's interesting is, is that it's easy for almost any technician to identify the 2018 low where we, we saw the dollar index trading in the 89.90 level. And it certainly is the most immediate short-term target for that you know, no further one, one and a half point drop where we could end up seeing a, a support line come in. But I really wanted to take a moment to look at the much bigger picture of the U.S. dollar cycle. I mean, everyone likes to kind of play this U.S. dollar collapse story, like it's a this big extreme event. But I really went and stepped back and said, well, there's been these currency swings for, for uh, decades and decades where these currencies would swing considerable big moves. And what is a level that the dollar could move without it actually collapsing? Just like what is a reasonable perspective? And so when we go to page three is the dollar index and I put up here uh, just over a decade, uh, we're going all the way back to 2008. And you can see that the dollar prior to the, uh, the bull market of the dollar, we saw considerable consolidations in the US dollar down along the 80 level. I mean, that, there were lows in the 70s, but a dollar index that actually trades back to the 80 level, it's not that we haven't seen this before. I mean, there, there's been considerable and extended periods which uh, the US dollar traded down there. The bigger question is on a big on a macro scale can Europe, because the dollar index is predominantly weighted against the um, the euro, can Europe sustain a much higher currency and what are the economic implications of it doing so? So my kind of view here on the dollar index is that on balance of probabilities, a test of this 89 level is, is almost uh, not a certainty, but a very good probability. But the bigger question, are we going to see a US dollar bear market that is uh, more of a prolonged multi here event that isn't necessarily a collapse, but rather simply the dollar going back to levels where it's been in the past decade. It's funny, you know, I look at this chart, Patrick, and maybe it's just because most of my experience is in trading crude oil. But when I look at this bigger picture, it just looks to me like, oh, Patrick, you, you got the crude oil chart upside down. You know, middle of 2014, that, that's where it collapsed. And of course, what we see is this very strong negative correlation between crude oil and the dollar. So if you want to say, okay, what would it mean for the U.S. dollar to go back down to 80, which seems you know crazy for the way we think about things? Well, all it would take would be to get back to 2014 oil prices. And for that to happen, I don't know whether or not Art Berman and other people who are saying that we, we're going to see this, this just dramatic collapse of, uh, of U.S. production in 2021 are right or not. But if that really happens, it could set the stage for exactly that move way, way up in oil and uh, way, way down in the dollar index. And you know what's interesting is is that a lot of people over the last three years have been talking inflation. But in my mind, the real inflation fears where break-evens could start blowing out and things start being priced in the yields really, to me, was always about a commodity bull market. And we've seen commodity bull markets and rising uh, structural prices often in periods of U.S. dollar bear markets or U.S. dollar declines. Forget the collapse word, but just a period for, of sustained U.S 
US dollar downtrend. And and the question here is if this has been set in motion and the dollar remains in a bear market for over a year and declines down to those consolidation lows where it spent most of the, the decade between 2008 to 2014, if we head back down there and, and we have a structural bull market and most broad commodities, that's where inflation may rear its head. And that's going to be really interesting to see whether that is the macro uh, backdrop that we're going to have to be investing and trading in going into the next few years, right? Well, of course, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe governments will get responsible overnight and uh, none of the things that we discuss here will ever come into play. Somehow, I don't think that's it. And frankly, you know, to, to say, as I look at this chart, is it that big of a deal for that 88 line to not hold? And boy, it doesn't look like there's any visible support until you get down pretty close to 80. You know, why is it unrealistic to expect a move down to 80 in the dollar index in an environment where people are really talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of fiscal spending. So we are moving the money into the real economy where it can be inflationary and uh, has a different effect completely than just creating bank reserves. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to monetize effectively a lot of money printing in order to do it. Why in the world wouldn't you think that we could get down to not only 80, but maybe down to what's the, what's that low going back to 2008, 73 or so, 72? Yeah. Um, you know, why wouldn't that come into scope in the next four year presidential cycle if we're going to see? the kind of spending and particularly monetized spending that may be on the horizon. We don't know yet exactly what the policies are going to be, but it sure seems like that's the direction. That's right. And so uh, well, I want to move on to chart four, which is really where we look at the euro against that U.S. dollar. And this is, a, to me, one of the more important questions because we can look at the dollar index and speculate all we want. But really, uh, with a, over a 50 percent weighting in the dollar index coming from the euro, it really is whether the euro can rally and more importantly, can the European Union be able to sustain a much higher currency? And that is a big question that is uh, out, out of my pay grade. I am looking at it more from a perspective of trend. But uh, one can quickly see that, again, if you go back to that 2008 to 2014 period, a lot of the uh, w high volume nodes all lie between 130 to 135. The interesting question is, is that as we approach what uh, everyone is targeting as this 125 level, which is the, the most immediate short term target, I mean, and what really is stopping the euro from trading back into those trade ranges that it traded uh, over a decade ago? And that's, uh, again, one of the more interesting puzzle pieces to watch as we uh, move forward from here, right? Well, I think the answer to that question is very clear. What's stopping it from moving higher is the toolbox that the ECB has to prevent it from moving higher because they are motivated to do so. Uh, are they running out of tools in that toolbox? That's the question. But I, I think what's really important is I look at this overall picture, you know, getting the call right on the relative performance. You know, we're getting into a competitive devaluation situation. If we go back for a second to page three, you know, what's to stop the dollar index? We said a minute ago from going all the way down to 80. Well, it's competitive devaluation where the ECB and the other central banks don't want to allow that to happen. They want their currencies to depreciate. Everybody's depreciating. It's really hard to make the call on who's going to win that political game between governments. On the other hand, to say, commodities are going to go up as priced in fiat currency. So gold, copper, and oil are going to get more expensive in all currencies. That's a much easier call to make. So the relative question of dollar versus other currencies, uh, probably beyond my pay grade. The, the outlook for the next decade that uh, gold, copper, other commodities, and, uh, and crude oil are all going to get more expensive in fiat currency, I think that's a much easier call to make. Right. So when we uh, move on to uh, page five, I have uh, the U.S. dollar against the uh, Chinese yuan. And uh, what's interesting here is, is that after establishing a, a, a topping formation up along the start of the year, 
and retesting that 710, 715 area numerous times. We now have a very, very distinct US dollar downtrend against the renminbi. And it really doesn't seem to be stopping or finding any support. And it's interesting because obviously um, the PBOC it takes into consideration a basket of currencies. It's not just against the US dollar. So, so it, there's a lot of different inputs here. But uh, this trend really seems to be set in motion and that uh, US dollar weakening again here may very well continue i mean we back in 2018 in a period where where uh, Trump was uh, president, we did see uh, uh, this uh, trade down towards six and a quarter. And so, I mean, is it out of uh, the realm of possibility for us to even see another 30 cents on the downside here? I don't think so. Well, I agree, Patrick. And I think the real question we're asking here is what is the U.S.-China geopolitical negotiating plan going to be between the Biden administration and China? And I have no idea. I'm sure there are plenty of analysts that are already thinking about exactly how that's going to go. But that's where the question is going to be answered is in how U.S.-China relations move on from here. For sure. And so I want to uh, move on now to looking at some of these different currencies on some of the other big crosses inside the dollar index, particularly let's look at the US dollar against the uh, the yen. And what's interesting is, is I, I wanted to capture Abenomics in here, the 2013 to 15 period where Jeffrey Snyder was uh, talking about it during the interview. And we can see during that period, the yen was literally halved in its price. The US dollar had an extraordinary rally during that, uh, that period. Period. But what's, what's amazing when you really zoom out to identify how much of a trade range we have literally seen for four years in the yen, there's been no significant trend and it's really been pinned in this range. And really, we have now uh, for the last month, really, it's for the first time in a while that we're starting to break below very key support lines on that uh, US dollar yen cross. And I mean, well, we did see a 2016 low around the 100 to 101 level. But now the, the big question here is as this US dollar yen weakens here, are we going to see a, a significant US dollar downtrend against this pairing? And that would be significant considering this tight trade range that we've seen for years. Moving on to page seven, Patrick, we're looking at the uh, the ratio the other way. This is the pound priced in dollars, uh, as where the other few were dollars priced in other currencies. So it's kind of upside down, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, so when we're looking here at the uh, pound sterling against the U.S. dollar, obviously the Brexit was a very big and key consideration to a breakdown out of what was a considerable trade range. But we've seen more or less, again, in a four-year period where that 120 level has held and established a very solid base. And it's just, it would be so significant if the, the pound was to break out above this 135 level. Because uh, when you have this type of a base for consolidation, all of the oversold conditions are unwound, all of the base is created. And that's usually a foundation from which a new trend may emerge. And it'll be really interesting to see whether that's uh, what we're about to get here in the pound. And let's talk about the Canadian dollar, Patrick. Uh, this, of course, relates to who buys the beer at the next Macro Voices live event. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so uh, the uh, the uh, US dollar against the Canadian dollar, this is, this is where we get to uh, into actually a number of really interesting charts, uh, because I started basketing a number of these countries that uh, rely quite heavily on trade with uh, from a commodities perspective, like the commodity based currencies. And what's interesting about all of these ones we're going to talk about is the considerable pop that they all had, the US dollar had during the coronavirus crisis. And so when you look at uh, on the charts here at the that, uh, you know, February, March period, April period in 2020, that US dollar had this uh, kind of safe haven element that caused it to just shoot higher. And what we're really seeing is now this transition where that has established a very key high tests. And we're seeing, for instance, in this case, the US dollar really starting to break down some key levels on the US dollar CAD. We're below 130. And really, if, if uh, some of those forecasts on oil and other types of like the way copper is behaving, the way so many of these other resources are behaving, and maybe it's time for uh, a lot of these commodity-based currencies to have their day in the sun after being in the doghouse for, uh, for so long.
Well, Patrick, speaking of commodity-based currencies, let's talk about the Australian dollar. Absolutely. The, the, and that was the really interesting part was that the, the Aussie dollar was always trading just uh, below the, well, the 70 le- cent level for an extended period of time going into 2020. And during the coronavirus crisis, we saw a legitimate washout event in the Aussie that sent it down uh, toward 55 cents. And that really led to a, a true capitulation moment. What's extraordinary about the Aussie dollar is just the the reflexive rally that we've seen off of those lows. Just the relative strength it's had against so many other currency pairs. It's it's just been rock and rolling higher. And we are now seeing it approaching some very key consolidation levels through that, that it saw through 2016 to 2018. And, uh, you know, could we see the Aussie trade toward 80 cents? I think it's entirely possible here. But I feel that uh, as we find out whether or not there's a true and legitimate commodity bull market underway, I think there's going to be even further tailwinds to these types of currencies. And that story continues when we, you know, look at the New Zealand dollar on um, page 10, where you can see that similarly, we're trading right back uh, and very close to the those levels uh, that we saw in 2017 and 18 with a strong trend. And even when we go to the Mexican peso on page 11, that coronavirus spike was just extraordinary, just uh, blew it out to the 25 level. And uh, it's come right, it's right, we're down below 20 again on the US dollar against the peso. And uh, we're coming to a major consolidation point. So a lot of these different currencies are uh, major transition moments where while Certainly, we can say the U.S. dollar has been in a downtrend over the last six months. I feel that on these really big, you know, weekly, longer-term charts, we're only actually approaching critical levels that that could uh, shift, that could create one of these multi-year trends. And I think it's a little early to already say that this is a certainty. But boy, are we coming to some interesting levels on all of these things, uh, and and will be probably a story going into January where we're going to see a lot of these levels tested that is going to determine what the trends will be for years to come. And boy, it sure looks like the, that pattern that you see of the big uh, coronavirus spike on the Mexican peso as I look ahead to the South African rand and uh, the Brazilian real. Looks like very similar charts. Yeah, so when we start getting into these uh, emerging market currencies, you can really see that similar style chart pattern, which is there There was the uh, coronavirus currency crash where the U.S. dollar as a safe haven just had this extraordinary punch. And we're seeing every single one of these currency crosses demonstrate a very similar pattern where and now they're rebounding considerably, coming back to those 2019 levels. I feel that when we're dealing with things like uh, the South African Rand or the uh, Brazilian Riel or even the Russian Ruble, which is on page 14, all of these are actually going to be very dependent on that commodities trend that we've talked about uh, earlier in this uh, post game. I think that these currencies currencies are transition moments. And we haven't seen big, like for instance, when looking at the Russian ruble on page 14, we haven't seen the US dollar really break down against the ruble yet. But if if that scenario in the coming year or two happens where oil goes considerably higher, we may see that this is actually a really important transitory moment in the, this currency. And not a lot of people are talking about, it. at least I haven't heard very many people talking about it yet. But it is interesting to see whether or not that becomes a key turn point for the ruble. Now, Patrick, we've been looking at primarily U.S. dollar crosses to other currencies. On page 15, we're not looking at a dollar cross. We're looking at the euro to the yen. Why euro yen today? Our focal point has always been in uh, macro voices. We always tend to to channel everything to the U.S. dollar because it is the world reserve currency. But it is really interesting to see where there's un- underlying prevailing trends that are occurring against all the different crosses. And the euro yen is one of the largest. And uh, and when you really look at that euro as it's trading against the yen, it's really, it really seems like we're we're winding up for an actual breakout. And that's interesting because when we looked earlier 
there at the yen chart, we saw how trade range bound it's been for the last four years. It's really the euro that has broken out. And it'll be really interesting to see whether the torch gets past the euro and where that really becomes the strongest currency in, in the bunch as, uh, as the US dollar becomes the weak one. And the breakout here will be, I think, the, the first sign that that may be the case. And I mean, it wouldn't shock me to see a euro yen advancing toward that 134, 135 level where we saw it back in 2018. And listeners, don't forget, you can get a free trial to Patrick's service. He does webinars four days a week with chart decks like this. You can find that at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode was made possible by the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, a focused play on miners and holders of uranium, and by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. Patrick, what can they expect to find in this week's Research Roundup? This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to Jeffrey Snyder's slide deck and the charts we just discussed here in the post game. There's also a link to a, a variant perception article titled Hidden Risks from ECB's Pandemic Tools and a link to a Jesse Felder report titled Even at the Peak of the Dot-Com Mania Stock Market Sentiment Was Not as Euphoric as It Is Today. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow Follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>